Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Introduction to Psychology. We are about to start our exploration of Chapter 5 on Consciousness. Chapter 5 is one of the shorter chapters in the textbook, and we will start covering it today, and I've assigned four lectures to it. So with 52 slides, I'll be on track if I reach slide 15 today, but I'm hoping I'll get to slide 17 and cover the stages of sleep so that we can come back on Wednesday to learn about dreaming. So these pictures here experience some well, they, they describe some things that people have experienced. Your consciousness refers to your subjective experience of, of yourself and your environment. And people report, you know, cross-culturally, things like feeling they've been, feeling like they're traveling to some form of light. Maybe feeling like they're outside of their body. Maybe they've they've seen things, things that are are quite frightening. Oh, um, I'm seeing a, a chat from from Jane saying I can't see any slides. Can other folks confirm for me whether or not you can see the slides? So one student can see the slides. Okay, so I'm not sure there may be a settings thing on your end, but I am sharing them. I'm also recording this, so if you can't see the slides, you could follow along with the slide deck that's posted, or you could uh, watch the recording after the fact. So these describe altered states of consciousness. You know, there's research, survey research suggesting that about 10% of people claim to have experienced or met an alien. And some people even report alien abductions. What, what might that be about? Have any of you ever met an alien? I haven't, but I once, um, as I was falling asleep, saw uh, a dark kind of being and, and it started approaching me. And as it approached, um, my ears started to ring more and more it felt like a, a sort of electric thing i remember that that left quite an impression on me these are altered states of consciousness so while our consciousness describes our subjective experience of the world of our bodies and of, of mental states, it can, it's a perception and, and it can go all kinds of interesting places. And in fact, we do not spend most of our time dealing with the world in the most grounded, objective way, right? Like when you're fully mindful and present, aware of your breathing, aware of your surroundings. We're not like that most of the time because we spend about 30% of our time sleeping. Sleep is one of the normal states of, of consciousness. I wouldn't call, I wouldn't really call sleep a, an abnormal state of consciousness. It's one we spend a lot of time in and, and we need it, but uh, our minds go to very interesting places while, while we sleep. 
There's a question in the chat about um, sleep paralysis. And yes, things can happen while we while we are sleeping that feel like real events. And, and sleep par paralysis defines a process where while you're in rapid eye movement sleep, you can't move. And that's a really good thing because if you could move, then you'd act out your dreams. We spend about 40% of our waking time daydreaming. The estimates vary from between like 30% to 50%. And some of us are, are bigger daydreamers than others, right? Always with your head in the cloud, maybe ruminating about something that happened in the past, maybe fantasizing about some, some future situation, what that might be like, what you might say, what they might say, how that situation could go down. There's an adaptive value to that because it lets you kind of try things out before doing that. Let's say you're thinking about asking somebody on a date and you're imagining, uh, well, you know, they might be in the lecture hall when I'm there and uh, I could just sort of pass by and, and say hi, like your shirt. And then, you know, he might say this and then I might say that. And then, you know, maybe as we left lecture, uh, I could say, hey, uh, you know, how about we go for coffee? And then then you might imagine that, right? You're, you're trying it out in your mind. And then you might think, well, you know, maybe I'll try something else. And, and you do these these runs through these run throughs and you might be able to. You know, catch some ways that it could go wrong right? if you do that, and then you might hopefully make the best decision and then go do something in the real world that has the best effect. So daydreaming can be very adaptive towards achieving your real world goals and we can maladaptively daydream like you could spend all your time you know ruminating about something that happened in the past that you can't change imagining what you might have done differently six different ways and maybe thinking about that isn't really going to get you anywhere or maybe you have wishful thinking about things that that are impossible and can't be achieved do you get the idea this is one of the functions of our mind, it has adaptive value and it can be applied maladaptively. And the bottom line is that we spend a lot of time not being grounded in the present moment, which is actually the only place that you can act and, and do things. And it's here and now. The, you know, the past is, is memory and, and the future is imagination. Then there are alterations of normal consciousness. Daydreaming is a normal kind of consciousness. Sleeping is a normal kind of consciousness. And they, they list like out of body experiences, near death experiences, uh, mystical experiences, and locked in syndrome. And locked in syndrome stood out to me because i don't know if i would consider that an alteration of normal consciousness it's a neurological disorder so i they mentioned somebody named uh, jean dominique bobby who wrote a book just by blinking his eye in this neurological disorder, a person may wake from a coma, say, after a stroke, and not that by, say, moving their eyes. They have a very, very limited ability to communicate. Be able to, to hear and feel and think just, you could imagine that would be a French L magazine and he wrote a book about his experience of locked in syndrome by blinking his eye his 
the practitioner he was working with presented him with an array of letters. It was the alphabet reorganized so that the highest frequency were letters in French came first. So E is the first letter and W is the last letter. And the, the person who was communicating with him would read through this list of letters. And when they got to the right letter, he would blink with his eye to indicate that. And by using that process, he could spell out a word in maybe one or two minutes. And he wrote this, this book over a, a period of maybe months with three hour sessions of doing this. You can imagine it'd be, be quite exhausting. And, and here's a couple of paragraphs for from what it's like. One day, for example, I can find it amusing in my 45th year to be cleaned up and turned over, to have my bottom wiped and swaddled like a newborn's. I even derive a guilty pleasure from this total lapse into infancy. But the next day, the same procedure seems to me unbearably sad, and a tear rolls down through the lather, a nurse's aid spreads over my cheeks and my weekly bath plunges me simultaneously into distress and happiness. The delectable moment when I sink into the tub is quickly followed by nostalgia for the protracted immersions that were the joy of my previous life. Armed with a cup of tea or a scotch, a good book or a pile of newspapers, I would soak for hours maneuvering the taps with my toes. Rarely do I feel my condition so cruelly as when I'm recalling such pleasures. Luckily, I have no time for gloomy thoughts. Already, they're wheeling me back, shivering to my room on a gurney as comfortable as a bed of nails. I must be fully dressed by 1030 and ready to go to the rehabilitation center. And he talks about how he turns down the, the jogging suit that the hospital provides so that he can sort of wear his own clothes because that makes him feel like he still has his, his identity. It's a, it's a great book and you can find it online, the full text. It's called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. And he died of pneumonia just as it was published. We definitely need to sleep, right? Sleep is one of our, one of the most important things that we do in the day, okay? And we know that we need sleep because when people are sleep deprived, things go really wrong. We know that sleep is essential for learning, right? for retaining what you learned for long-term memory formation and, and even for remembering emotional information, okay? It has an important role in learning and memory. So go to sleep before your exams. It's really important for your immune system. If you're sleep deprived, you're more likely to pick up a bug, It'll be harder to heal. People who are well rested are more insightful and better at problem solving. It has a role in, in neural development. And it's one way that our body conserves energy and, and takes care of itself. Uh, as you're up during the day, some toxin is produced. And one of the functions of sleep is for your body to clear that out. And if you were to stay up, it would keep building up. We have a circadian rhythm. A circadian rhythm refers to cyclical biological changes that happen on a 24 hour basis. So there are changes in your alertness, in your arousal, in your metabolism, in your hormone levels that occur on a daily basis. Waking up is stressful. Okay, you're going to have a cortisol spike in the morning as you get up, right? That happens to you as your body prepares to, to get up. And then later in, in the day, 
when the lights go down, you'll produce more something called melatonin, which will help you go to sleep. Your biological clock is the suprachiasmic nucleus. It's in the hypothalamus. And its production of melatonin is regulated by your exposure to light. And so that's one of the reasons why it's important to, to turn the lights down before you go to sleep. As you know, if you've ever traveled, you can disrupt your circadian rhythm, say through jet lag, right? If you've ever done shift work, some some jobs will tell you, all right, you know, you're you're working nine to five today and you know, seven to three tomorrow and, and overnight the next day, that can really mess people up. And that can lead to to health problems. So how much sleep do we need? That varies for different animals. Cats sleep as much as newborn babies. And, and think about how, think about cats' energy levels. What do they do? They're obligatory carnivores. They have to eat meat. Vegetables are not an option for them. And they need to have really, really intense bursts of energy to chase down, fight, kill their prey. So they spend a lot of their time in a kind of low energy state, sleeping, and then they're able to have a really intense burst of energy when they're hunting. And you see the same pattern in, in the bigger cats, like lions and tigers. Just looking at humans, the amount of sleep that we need varies across our lifespan. Newborns sleep as much as cats, and there's a lot of neural development going on while they're sleeping. College and university students, so young adults, need a bit more sleep than people in middle adulthood like me. But people in, in middle or older adulthood like me are the ones that, that make the rules about when your classes are. And so you'll have 8.30 in the morning classes, and that works for relatively older people who, um, you know, are up like a light at seven in the morning and ready to go. But that, uh, that could be hard for you. And in fact, your brain probably needs the sleep, okay? Like teenagers need more sleep, but we try to, you know, we complain about them sleeping in and, and yell at them and drag them out of bed and, and send them to school at 8.30. Do they actually need that? And uh, there's a comment from Chance saying that uh, I get sleep paralysis and sleepwalking and nightmares with with oversleeping yeah there it is possible to sleep too much right it, it's more sleep is is better up to a point most people are sleep deprived and could use a little more sleep there is uh there's a research study where they just let people come into the lab and and sleep as much as they wanted and what most people did was go and sleep for like 14 hours and then they were way better after that. Well, chronically oversleeping wouldn't do you much good. Now, I'm seeing a comment about sleep paralysis and I suspect, I feel like I might've made a mistake there when I was lecturing before and I talked about REM sleep. So give me a moment to correct myself. Yeah, so sleep, Paralysis is a normal part of the REM sleep, which is part of your sleep cycle. So it's a good thing during REM sleep. However, it's a disorder when it occurs outside of REM sleep. Okay, 
you wouldn't want to find yourself suddenly paralyzed when when you shouldn't be. And there is that I see a question from um, well, first, there's a, a comment from Jane saying, no matter what I do or when I go to sleep, if I don't have to get up early in the morning, sleep for 12 hours straight. It's strange how different sleep needs can be. It's true that we need different amounts of sleep. There are some people who have a genetic mutation who can do with two hours of sleep a night. Imagine how much you could get done. Right, if you only needed to sleep for an hour or two or a night. And then the there's an, an idea out there that we should be getting, say, eight hours of sleep. But that's that's a, an average, and there are people who legitimately need more sleep. And and I'm one of them. You no, know, I might be happier with 10 hours of, of sleep. Jane needs 12. And there are also differences in the circadian rhythm such that there are people who are morning people who have most of their energy in their morning. And then there are people who are night owls and have most of their energy in the evening. But when we, when society comes up with routines for children and young people, one way of being is imposed on everyone. And, and it's the idea that you should get up early in the morning, you know, be ready for class at 8.30, and then, you know, say, go home at 3 or at 5. Well, in reality, some of us need to sleep in more, and some of us would probably prefer evening classes. You get more flexibility with this kind of stuff as you get older. Right? In, in university, you, you have more power to pick your courses and your course times than you did in high school. But when you go out into the world of work, sometimes you can have a, a schedule imposed on you again that, that doesn't work well for you if you're doing, say, shift work. And uh, there was a comment about asking about, about research, and I wasn't sure what, what research you mean. Was it the one about people coming into the lab and, and what they do when they're given the opportunity to sleep, because I could find that for you. But then there's a comment saying there's there's a joke. But I, I would I would look that up for you if, if you wanted that. And Chant says that they went many years only sleeping three or four hours. I'm envious. Was that a highly productive time in your life? but didn't feel healthy at that time, was always energized. So six to seven hours is, is a better fit. And, and Marcus, I will find that study for you. I'm going to write a note in my agenda, send reference on sleep study to Marcus. Actually, you know what I'll do? I'll send it out to the class. And then maybe someone can can summarize it as a, a research credit. Older people get less sleep, but that's not because they need less sleep. It's because they have more disrupted sleep. They have less of the deeper slow wave sleep. So they wake up earlier and more often, but that's not necessarily a good thing. So what happens when people are sleep deprived? Lots of bad things. We can study this experimentally in humans by bringing them into a sleep lab and sleep depriving them for different periods and then seeing what happens. But with humans, we can't take that to the point of harm. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> it's an occupational health hazard of lecturing. Um, there are 
studies with animals where they force total sleep deprivation on the animal and see how long it, it can go. And those studies result in, in death, like the death of the rat after about four days. So sleep is biologically necessary. If we don't sleep, we start to break down. Sleep deprivation is a strong predictor of depression. There's one psychologist who always checks with every new client whether they're sleeping enough as a matter of practice. Because if you have somebody coming into therapy for depression and everything's so terrible and they feel so awful and hopeless, what good is talking about it going to do if what they really need to do is go get some sleep? You'd expect that that any kind of therapy would be ineffective, except for maybe some behavior change counseling about getting better sleep. Like maybe you could talk about sleep hygiene. But that tells you how important the role of sleep is to having good moods. Sleep deprivation generally leads to dysregulation in mood. So you're you're sadder, but you're also more unstable and, and irritable. And that can lead to more interpersonal conflict. There is some connection between mood and serotonin. There are treatments for depression that are that regulate that help regulate serotonin. So antidepressants are often serotonin reuptake inhibitors that increase the amount of serotonin in your body. There's connection between serotonin, mood, and sleep. Melatonin, uh, sorry, serotonin is a precursor of melatonin. So those things are connected. And sleep deprivation leads to worse moods and more unstable moods. It uh, results in impaired, impaired attention, impaired learning, impaired memory, or task performance, right? more accidents. Those can be very serious accidents. I think of someone falling asleep at the wheel. It leads to an increased risk for cardiovascular problems. And it decreases immune system functioning. It also makes you eat more and, and gain more weight. It affects your metabolism, right? It slows it down. And that's just a short list. And I'm sure there's many other things that it impairs. Now, I'm going to look at the questions in, in the chat. Hmm. So Chance played World of Warcraft and, and painted while staying up. Uh, that sounds like fun. I used to enjoy World of Warcraft. Um, and Michaela writes, so instead of the depression causing lack of sleep, lack of sleep is causing the depression. How can you tell which one is the true cause? That is a great question. And I can say that sleep deprivation causes symptoms of depression. Depression, a diagnosis of depression requires the symptoms to be around for at least two weeks. And you couldn't 
you probably wouldn't want to keep somebody in a lab sleep depriving them for two weeks until they come down with a diagnosis of, of clinical depression. But experimental research on sleep deprivation would you know, produce, finds causal evidence of its role in producing what I will call like symptoms of depression. And when I say symptoms of depression, I'm steering away from a clinical diagnosis of depression. And then there'd be correlational research showing that people with diagnoses of depression uh, have worse sleep. But to answer your question, how can you tell which one is the true cause? You need to take people into the lab right, and, and sleep deprive them and see if that leads to symptoms of depression. Interestingly, um, if you look up the diagnostic standards for depression, one of them is sleep de deprivation. So I'm right now I'm going to Google the criteria for depression. So DSM-5 criteria for depression. There are different versions of depression like major depressive episodes or major depressive disorder. Depression describes the state of low, um, really low energy and, it, and, and of fatigue. And it makes sense that that would be connected to sleep deprivation, right? If you get sleep deprived, your energy gets really low. So, here I have a, a list of depressive symptoms. And to get a diagnosis, the person would need to show at least five symptoms during the same two week period that are a change from previous functioning. And I'm looking through this list. So one of them is say loss of, in loss of interest or pleasure. And one of them is insomnia or hypersomnia nearly every day. So sleeping too little or sleeping too much is one of the diagnostic indicators for major depression. And another one is saying is, is fatigued and, and decreased concentration. And those are also things that can come from lack of sleep. The bottom line, sleep is very important to, to your mood. And I'm going back to the chat to read the messages. And, and Chance answers that it's a vulnerability factor for depression, which is true. It's also part of the definition of, of depression, which is a bit circular. All right, on to the next slide. Sleep hygiene refers to good practices to help protect your sleep. So strong sleep hygiene means having both a bedroom environment and a daily routine that promote consistent uninterrupted sleep. There are things that you can do that will damage your quality of sleep. One of those is drinking alcohol. Alcohol helps you get to sleep, but it doesn't help you stay asleep and, and it disrupts your sleep. Um, I see a question about depression from, from Calvin saying, does that mean you could just make yourself depressed with certain behaviors? Clinically depressed, I mean. A behaviorist would say yes. If you were to look at the list of criteria for depression and you decided to go do all those things, right? You decided to be chronically underslept. You decided to have thoughts of inappropriate guilt and of worthlessness. And yeah, I'm sure you you wouldn't help yourself, right? If you did all those things, 
right? Some of them, some of them aren't choices. Like feeling fatigued isn't isn't really a choice, but you could do things to run yourself down and and make yourself feel fatigued and therefore tick that box. So I'm gonna go with a yes for Calvin. If you wanted to do that to yourself, absolutely, you have the power to do that. That doesn't mean that people who are who have depression intentionally made a, a choice or set of choices to to become depressed. There are many reasons why people develop depression and I've never met a depressed person that wanted to be like that. But to answer your question, if you were determined to induce depression in yourself through your own choices, you could absolutely do that. Back to uh, sleep hygiene. So one of the best things you can do for yourself is to have a consistent, stable sleep schedule. Right? Not one that changes around every day where you then sleep in on the weekend to catch up on your sleep. But pick a time that's the same time to go to bed every night. And before you do that, have a wind down period maybe about an hour where you turn down the lights, where you have have a pre-bed ritual. Maybe you brush your teeth and, and floss them too. Maybe you um, put on your pajamas. Right? You should turn off your, your phone, turn down the lights, turn off the TV. So a relaxing routine that helps you prepare for bed, right? Take advantage of the power of classical conditioning. All the things in that routine and in your bedroom should be associated with sleep. It's best if you don't use your bedroom for things outside of, you know, sleep or sex and getting dressed or undressed. It's best if you don't have a TV in your bedroom. It's best if you don't work from your bedroom because if you do those things, you reduce the associative power of the items and the events in that environment. In the best case scenario, Everything in your room is associated with sleep so that you go in there and just seeing those cues triggers your body to power down and go to sleep. It's good to get sunlight during the day because your suprachiasmic nucleus responds to sunlight. Hey, A lot of us stay inside all the time in, in windowless rooms with artificial light, and that can mess with your circadian rhythm. There is a question from Chance that says, what if watching TV makes you fall asleep? I think it's better than alcohol. It's probably not the best way to go to sleep because after you fall asleep, the TV will still be on. And it's going to be making light and noise that will interfere with your ability to stay asleep. I think there are better. I, I, I wouldn't consider watching TV up until the point that you fall asleep to be good sleep hygiene. That said, if something really works for you, then power to you and and I don't want to knock it. It is best to reduce your alcohol consumption and your caffeine consumption. Some folks only drink caffeinated drinks in the morning so that it doesn't disrupt their sleep later on. Exercising during the day also helps you sleep at night. If you find yourself tossing and turning, it's best to get up, 
leave the environment and go do something, something relaxing in low light until you feel tired again and then go back to bed. If you stay in bed, tossing and turning with your mind racing or your mind running, then you're starting to associate being in bed with being like that. And ideally, we want to keep your bed purely associated with uninterrupted sleep. So if your sleep gets interrupted, you can't get back to sleep easier. It's best to, to get up and go do something in order to preserve the association between your bedroom and your bed and sleeping. Encephalography, which we discussed as a way that scientists measure brain activity, has demonstrated that there are different stages of sleep. So we cycle through five stages of sleep in roughly 90 minute cycles. The first four stages are called non-REM sleep and REM sleep. And the fifth stage is called REM sleep. One of the things you'll notice from these graphs here is that during REM sleep, it's your, your brain activity is quite similar to wakefulness. But hopefully you're paralyzed and dreaming. Okay, so you, you're paralyzed you, so that you can't act out your dreams. Stages one to four don't involve the rapid darting eye movements of REM sleep. And there are fewer dreams or no dreams, where the dreams that you have are, are different in quality. They might just be more static and, and image-like. But the, the dreams associated with REM sleep are these vivid story-like dreams. We start off with stage one sleep. It's a transitional phase between, between sort of calm wakefulness and going to sleep. And when you're in this stage, you might not realize that you're falling asleep. You might not know. You think, am I, am I falling asleep? Okay. You might have some strange visions or sensations. You might experience um, sort of static fleeting images. You might see specks. You might see tunnels of light. A lot of people who, when people talk about alien abductions where they are, are drawn up in some kind of a, a, a tunnel of light, when you ask, the, when, when people ask where this happened, it's from their bedroom when they were going to sleep. You don't hear a lot of stories about these ab abductions that happen while people are going about their business during the day. So, but, so seeing tunnels of light is part of the phenomena of stage one sleep. There are other sensations. Um, for example, hearing, imagined speech. You might have a sensation of taste. People start jerking. You might feel like you are falling backwards and then you catch yourself. And that's called a hypnic jerk. And what's happening to your brain while this is going on is that the brain waves are slowing down. There's a further slowing down into stage two, okay? And there's also a drop in temperature and in heart rate. There's an interesting pattern to the, the brain waves. They're, they're slowed down, but then there are these bursts of activity. Let me turn on my laser pointer. Here you can see what's called a sleep spindle. There's suddenly more activity and then 
over here, there is a, a big drop in activity and a, and a spike, okay? And that's called a K-complex. So sleep spindles and K-complexes are part of the phenomena of stage two sleep. And that takes up about 65% of our sleep in total. In stages three and four, the brain waves continue to slow down. See how these waves are kind of more spaced apart than the ones you see when we're awake, okay? So the wavelength has increased in terms of distance between the peaks. This is really important to feel rested and children spend more time in this deeper slow wave sleep and we see it disrupted in elderly individuals and it's also uh, disrupted by alcohol use. Sleepwalking is a phenomenon that happens in, in stage three sleep and people who sleepwalk you know, they might get up and, and get out of bed. They might also engage in more complex behaviors. I've, I've been told that I go to the kitchen and to the fridge and fix myself a snack. There are rare cases of people like getting in a car and driving. There's been a case of somebody going over to his in-laws, breaking into their house and murdering them. Sleepwalking has been used as, as a legal defense. Are any of you guys sleepwalkers? There's an idea that people who sleepwalk are like these sort of zombies, but but that's not true. You wouldn't the arms up like that thing is is a myth. The so stage five is REM sleep. REM stands for rapid eye movement. And in this stage, we see brain activity that is similar to wakefulness. And it, the REM stages become longer as the night goes on. You should be paralyzed during REM sleep. Otherwise, you would act out the, the vivid story-like dreams. Now, I see some comments in in the chat, and let me see. So there's, uh, yes, yeah, so children, some children sleepwalk and then grow out of it. Um, Shirley says, my sister is a sleepwalker and a sleep talker, and another sleeps with her eyes open sometimes. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Jill said, I used to sleepwalk as a kid when I had anxiety. Not sure if that has to do with it, though. I don't know. Good question. And Charmaine says, I don't get how you sleepwalk. Don't you bump yourself into a wall? Um, I can confirm that I have bumped into a wall while sleepwalking and like repeatedly because in my in my mind, I thought I was some in, in my, I guess I was having a dream. Maybe I thought I was going to the bathroom. It was not the bathroom. Um, let's see what other comments are there. Chant says, I usually change clothes. Oh, it's about um, it's about sleepwalking. I usually change clothes, eat, drink water, brush my teeth, get a new blanket, go to sleep on the couch. Okay, that's that sounds like more more personal, more uh, purposeful behavior. And uh, Michaela is scared that her child might sleepwalk and and leave the house or get injured while. She's asleep. So so mom's asleep and not watching, and the sleepwalking child could get into trouble. Uh, Marcus says, my cousin was an absolute sleepwalker. It used to haunt me how he walked when I was still a kid. And Jill sleeps talk, and that scares her boyfriend because she says scary things. Ugh. Chance typically wakes up within five minutes of sleepwalking and can remember some things like from maybe the four to five minute mark. Hmm. 
and it feels a bit like being drunk. Interesting. Hey, um... Yes. Also, uh, my brother used to sleepwalk. I don't know if he does anymore. He apparently would get up, rearrange his room, go sit with my dad in the living room, and actually have a conversation with him. Like, wow. he wouldn't respond to what dad was saying, but he would actually converse with him, um, but wouldn't be able to respond when dad asked him a question, but would be able to actually hold a conversation somewhat. And he would, like, so, rearrange his room and things like that, and then go back to bed. And it's like, we had to start putting a chair under the door, the, the front door handle, because one night dad found him outside standing in the snow in his bare feet. So we had to actually start putting a, a chair under the door handle because he then started to go outside. So it was very dangerous, but it was the weirdest thing. And no one knew about it, but dad mentioned it one day. Trevor didn't even realize he was doing it. <laughs> wow. That's fascinating. So it's interesting that he had some behavior where it was as if he was going to converse, but it's not really a conversation because he's not able to respond. He's just saying his own his own thoughts but that that is fascinating you can see how that could create a complicated situation for parents so thank you for for sharing and chance says one of my childhood friends peed in his his father's boots oh no that time i was sleepwalking and trying to go to the bathroom i didn't make it to the bathroom um so as you go as you sleep, you go through multiple stages of sleep. So maybe there's like five or six or seven of them. As you can see from this graph, okay, showing the stages of, it shows the stages of sleep that you go through. You always start with stage one and then you move into stage two, right? Drop into stages three and, and four, okay? And then you'd have, some REM sleep and you go and move kind of through these cycles and, and come up to this point of where you might wake up a bit okay and then you go back into another sleep cycle and as the night goes on you have fewer of these deep sleep stages okay you see that the sleep is getting shallower okay? and you have multiple REM sleep periods. So when you come up to the state of, back up to the state of wakefulness, you're not really, you're not waking up. Some of you might wake up, but you go into to REM sleep where your mind is like in a waking stage. And so you have a few REM sleep periods during the night and, and then you, you finally awake. You can see here that you come out of REM sleep into wakefulness. It is possible for some people to have REM sleep actually intrude on their, onto the, I'm not finding the right words, onto waking up. So you can come, wake up from sleep and still have an intrusion of, of REM sleep, of the dreams. So you might see things that aren't really there. Or you might have an extension of that paralysis. So now you're really awake, but you can't move. And that paralysis is a holdover from REM sleep. I see we ran a little over time. Thank you for your attention. I'll stop the recording here and we'll pick up with dreams at the next lecture. <laughs>